trails and ghost towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and with me is Bill Barley, who for years now has been telling me stories about uh, gold trails, ghost towns, silver, lead, zinc, and all sorts of other interesting stories. Today we're back in the southern part of British Columbia. Yeah. What's the name of the country we're going to? Well, Mike, we're going into the Smilk Mean, and we're going into Headley. Now, it wasn't called Headley at first. It was called Skazisht, which was the Indian name for a striped rock place. And really, it's, uh, this, uh, this photograph indicates exactly what they saw. And you know, this is interesting country because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's Hudson's Bay country, it's mining country, it's ranching country. Uh, the Hudson's Bay was in there, along with the Indians, of course, then some ranchers, and some of those ranchers are still there. Yeah. And um, I love driving through that valley today from the point of view of the rock and from the point of view of the way that valley and the meandering Similkameen just, it, it seems like a, an Eden almost. Oh, it's, it, it's beautiful country. I've wandered through this for decades and... Uh, this gives you an idea of, of the terrain of the valley, the, the verdant valley floor and the mountains and the, on either side. And uh, it's, it's really quite a spectacular sort of country. It's really a finger of the, of the great American desert again, which comes up through that area and uh, goes up towards the, the Thompson country. It strikes me that uh, the European influence, uh, even after the fur traders, they all, all had to come up this country to get to uh, Granite City, where all the gold was found in the 1860s. Yeah, well, what happened, Mike, is that the, the Dudney Trail came through that country in the early 1860s, and that came from, essentially from Fort Hope right over to the Wild Horse. So the Dudney Trail was the great highway of the South. This was the all-red route, and a lot of people traveled along the Dudney Trail. You know, I mean, the, 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 the brigade men did to a degree, and certainly the, the early prospectors, the placer men came through, Indians used the trail, and all sorts of traders used the trail. So when did they become interested in Headley? Well, actually, what happened was this, is that, uh, that Headley became kind of a lodestone for prospectors after the early strikes of the 1890s, Mike. So you had strikes in Rossland, you had the strikes in the Slocan and in Nelson, and people began ranging through this area. They realized the southern part of British Columbia was, was mineral territory. And they, they looked at this, this mountain and decided that, oh, this is very interesting. And they saw the, the striations on the rock and the different colors in the rock, and they thought it might be very good, and indeed it was. Indeed it was. That's a, a good place to take a break and come back in a moment and talk about just how rich the striations in the rock made a few people. We'll do that right after these words. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley. A neck of the woods called Skacious by the Indians, striped rock, yeah. but uh, it's gone through a lot of changes since yeah. then. Yeah, well, the whites, because the Dudney Trail came through, which was the British route on the Canadian side of the line, yeah. and they, uh, they had mileposts all along the route. One of them was Vermilion Forks, and 20 miles from Vermilion Forks, a narrow creek cut out of the canyon, and they called this 20 Mile. So that was, that was the second name, was 20 Mile. But it soon changes again. Because what happens, a guy called Peter Scott comes in, Mike, and he's down on his luck. He's a prospector. He's a wanderer. He's, he's a tramp, tramp miner, really. is, And he's, he came from the Slocan District, didn't make a stake there, but he staked by a guy called Robert Headley. And Robert Headley was a far-seeing individual. He was head of Hall Mines in Nelson. So he stakes Scott, and Scott goes up a mountain which later became known as Nickel Plate. Mm -hmm. Not at this time, unnamed at this time. And he goes up this mountain at several thousand feet. He stakes a claim which he thinks is very good. He calls it the Rollo. Now, the Rollo is right in about the middle of this shot. And we see these claim sizes. How big is a claim? Well, a claim is 1,500 by 1,500 feet, so it's around 40 acres. And this, his claim, the Rollo, is nice and square because I guess he's the first one on the mountain and he, f he figures it out perfectly. Well, for sure. Yeah. All right, that's the claim map. We're going to be hearkening back to this map in just a, a little while because it keeps cropping up in this. Yeah. Now, what did these guys take with them to, to do this kind of work? Well, originally they, they took a pick, always took a pick, yeah. and they took they take a, a bag to carry ore samples down, and sometimes they take something like this. This, and is, this just, is this is a killer. How come I always get the heavy work? <laughs> and then I had to do something with a brake for a. Uh, 
And this is a little beauty. <laughs> and it's yeah. it's a motor and pestle, but it's an automatic, you know, an one of the automatic motor, motor and pestles. Automatic, you can use arm power on it. And of course, the ore would go in there and crush it down to a fine powder, and they'd see if there was any free gold in there, Mike. And of course, it is really quite a nice, uh, a nice artifact from the Old West. That's a, I mean, do you just go down to your local mining supply store and come up with one sure, of these? Sure, sure. Probably cost you only $15 or something 15 like that. 15 bucks. Sure. And all the backbone you can take. Yeah. That's a good one. And so th that would be part of the miner's equipment to go up and see whether he's got any good ore. Sure. Obviously, Mr. Headley staked the right guy because the roller was pretty rich. Yeah, but he should have staked some more, and he didn't. He only staked one claim. This is interesting because two Swedes follow him in. Jacobs and, and Johnson, and Jacobson is, uh, is a fairly experienced miner, so is Johnson. And they go in there, and they stake two more, and they're following, they go past the Rollo, and they stake the Copper Cliff, which is kind of interesting, and another one called the Mound. And both those are fairly good claims, but they only stake two. And that's is it because of the energy required to work a claim was such that uh, it was foolish, to, or did they think that they had it? They always. The miner stakes a claim, he thinks that's it. Right. And, but they're followed by two guys who are so green it is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. Two young, uh, young Englishmen, Arundel and Wollaston, <laughs> they come in there. And it's kind of an interesting story, Mike. What happens is this. They're camped at the bottom of 20 Mile, and they have never staked a claim before. And across the creek, across 20 Mile Creek, is another camp of veteran prospectors. And they're looking around too, but they're... And so these guys, green as they are, they go up to ask one of these old veteran prospectors, they say, where should we, uh, where should we really uh, uh, get a good claim? And he looks at the, he looks at the top of what, what is Nickel Plate Mountain, and he says, well, boys, if you go right up over the top, he says, and down the other side, it's marvelous in there. He says, you'll see free gold right there, he says. Because <laughs> he's just kidding. Because you know, he figures the best claims have been staked. Yeah. But they take him at his word. It takes them two days to go up this, this precipitous area, and a very precipitous area, tough to get into, and very tough then, because no trails. And they go up over the top, turn around, and they come across magnificent ore. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a rotten red bedrock with, uh, with a coppery tone to it, and there is actually free gold in the ore. And they take about eight, they stake, they stake one, two, three, four, five claims. The horsefly, the bulldog, the sunny side, the nickel plate, that's very interesting, and finally the copper field. And to promote them, they figure they've got a, the world by the tail, they take a whole bunch of samples, they go down to New Westminster. In the typical way, I mean, you don't sort of hide this information and keep it to yourself, you take it out in advertising. That's right, they go down to New Westminster, uh, an exhibition down there, and they, they show the samples there, and a guy who's wandering through that and has heard about British Columbia is a guy called M.K. Rogers. And he's the front man, Mike, for a guy called Marcus Daly, who is one of the copper kings of Butte. We heard about Fritz Augustus Heinz, and Marcus Daly is the other, this one of the others, and the other one was a guy called William Clark. And so he spots this, this magnificent ore with free gold shot all through it, and he looks at it, and he gets in touch with the two, two stakers, realizes they're green. They ask about $100,000, which is right out of sight. He manages to talk them down to 60000 And then he goes up there, and they say, okay, we'll take a bond on this for $60,000, which is about $2 million today, Mike, if, you know, 30 to 40 times as much, at least that's a lot of money then, no taxes or anything. So then they tell him where it is, and he goes up and he takes a look at all of them, and he comes upon the nickel plate, and he sees exactly what they saw. And it is really quite remarkable. He was so keen on it, he took out a pack load, and this is 1898 now, Mike. Yeah. And he takes out a pack load on his back, 120 pounds of ore, and he, he wires Marcus Daly, send me $60,000, we want to pick up this option. And Daly sends him $60,000, and they pick up the option, and the nickel plate comes into being, and this is to be one of the great mines, one of the absolute spectacular mines in Canada in the turn of the century. And we owe it all to two greenhorns, Williston and Arundel, who say, uh, please, sirs, can you show us where to stake the thing? And and they happen on it. That's right. What a piece of dumb luck, eh? Well, what yeah. a marvelous yeah. piece of dumb yeah. luck. They, they, and they, of course, they think they have the golden touch. They never do hit another magnificent find like that. But, but with two million bucks in their pocket, or the equivalent of $60,000 in their pocket, they're, they're fixed. Sure, and so we have, we have you know, eight claims staked on the mountain. And then we have a lot of other claims staked on the mountain. But there's a guy sitting down in, in, in Trout Creek, Lower Summerland at that time. And he's a, he's a canny Scot. His name is Duncan Woods. And he's looking over the claims map. And he looks over and see it's all staked, but there's a little fraction, a little wedge in there, Mike. Just and a, a fraction pie. is, yeah, that's right, just a piece of the pie. And not very big, only a few acres. 
So he looks at that, and the more he looks at it, the more he likes it. And so he says to a kind of a wandering prospector, a staker, a guy called George Cahill who lived in that country, he says, George, he says, you go up and stake that for me. And he says, go up there in the, in the wee hours of the morning, nobody will know. So Cahill goes up this, this terrific mountain, which is now called Nickel Plate Mountain, yeah. and he goes out on, a, on, the, on the rim rock, right out on the little ledge out there, and he stakes what they call the mascot fraction. Now, the mascot fraction is very interesting because as time goes on, it becomes much more important than the story of Headley. All right. And the, the Woods, what, what makes Woods this kind of a person? I mean, is, he's just got time in his hands sitting at Summerland, or, or is, he, is, he, is he a player? He's, is he a player in these kinds of activities? Oh, yeah, he is. He, he, he kind of, you know, he gets in on these little properties and hangs on to them, and, uh, but he, he waits for a while. And what is happening, though, while, they, while he is waiting, of course, Headley is starting to progress, yeah. and there's no doubt about that. Uh, these shots fascinate me when I get a chance to see these old guys. Uh, and all sorts of artifacts are visible. These guys have got uh, those uh, lights on their oh, yeah. helmets. <laughs> Sticking Johnnies. Yeah, three of these guys are miners. And interesting, Mike, the second one from the left is, is Johnson, one of the original stakers uh, of the mound and, and the copper cliff. And he probably has this property. And, but the guy fourth from the left, or second from the right, yeah, is... The tallest it, of them all. That, that's right, is a guy called Nick Picard. And Nick Picard is a very interesting guy because he's a real character. He is always down on his luck. He is usually broke, but he likes beer. And he likes beer so much that he figures he's going to get it for nothing. And how he gets it for nothing, he would quite often walk into one of the major hotels in, in, in Headley when Headley was booming. And uh, he would notice that the whole bar was elbow to elbow with miners. And they're not about to move for, for Nick Picard. Well, he has a way to make them move. Mm -hmm. He takes off his Mackinac. Out of his Mackinac slithers a great, big, huge rattlesnake. And the bar is clear. <laughs> and of course, the card sits down. Of course, there are a lot of, lot of glasses that haven't even been touched because he's got it scattered outside. They don't want to fool with a rattlesnake. And uh, he just helps himself, and the drinks are free, and he has as much as he wants. And he pulled that stunt many times. Very interesting character. And uh, he avoided being bitten, I uh, presume? Oh, yeah, he'd defanged it, but they didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that'll work somewhere else. I don't know. This, look, at all of the stuff that gets moved into the area has to come from somewhere. What is this uh, piece of equipment? Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the early, early boilers that comes into, the, into, the, into play, and uh, it's, it's really a magnificent effort to move that up the hill. And they had to move it up a hill that's carved out a sidewinding hill going all the way up yeah. to the top, and uh, that goes into the, into the nickel plate. And they would have shipped that in or, or, or trucked it in or freight wagoned it in from where? So. Yeah, probably. Probably came in by train, probably. Possibly, or possibly in over the route from Penticton. Just have been a rough, a rough yep. go anyway. Yeah. And this is one of the early hotels, and this is this gives you an idea of one of the log hotels in Headley. And Headley is starting to get going just after 1900, and it's really becoming quite a... And there, there were merchants are starting to move in. This is W.T. Shatford, and he was an MPP, a member of the provincial parliament. A very well-known guy, an entrepreneur, a mining promoter. And, but he has some competition, too, Mike. This is Mr. Schubert. Look at all his customers. Oh, yeah, he's one of the main rivals of, of Shatford, and they're all standing out there. Schubert's on the way. He wants to get in on the ground floor, and Headley's becoming quite a city. Mike. And I just see some of the uh, some of the things that you've managed to pick up for your collection. This is a, a seltzer bottle, that's, uh, you know, siphon, yeah. siphon, and written right on that sort of acid engraved, Similkamine Bottling Works, Headley City. Oh yeah, that's really marvelous, Mike, because they thought Headley was going to become a city. It was going to be another Nelson or a Rossland or a Phoenix, you name it. And there was reason for that, Mike, and the reason was this, is because down the hill from the nickel plate and the sunny side was flowing millions of dollars in ore. I mean, it came down steadily, and it came down into this plant. This was the Daily Reduction Company mill. Forty stamps, and there, there's uh, Gillespie's teams going into Penticton there. And uh, 40 stamps going boom, 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 Mike, steadily, day in and day out, night in and night out, all day long, in many instances. And, and they were crushing out and getting millions of dollars in dividends. And the strange thing about it, when those stamp mills stopped booming, people missed it. And it was the pulse of the community, the heartbeat. And when it stopped, I guess people said, what's going on? That's, what's the trouble? What's wrong? That's right. Not much wrong. This is a, a kind of a lonesome shot of uh, Headley City, a bit of a, 
a messy street scene. Oh yeah, lots of boulders on the street and Headley's just getting its feet. And uh, this is indicative of what is happening in Headley. And of course you had a lot of interesting people in Headley. Gomer Jones was the Australian mi manager of the mine. He was a superintendent. And of course his wife, Mrs. Gormer P. Jones, she was at the pinnacle of, of, of society in Headley and she let everybody know it. And there are a few scraps too, but she always maintained that place. Mrs. Gomer Jones. Oh yeah, you bet. Okay. And Headley had other things too, Mike. It had, you know, it had a golf course, which is really quite astounding just after the turn of the century, had tennis courts, gain at first, and it had a baseball team and a hockey team. And here's the baseball team, 1919, supplied by Billy Estabrooks of, of, uh, of Summerland. And this shows these guys had to be baseball players in the summer and hockey players in the winter. And then they'd work at the mine. So they were given a good job and they had to do both of those things. And it perked along. Uh, how many people, uh, I guess, uh, frequented the hotels, frequented the, the uh, saloons and places around town? Well, here's, here's one of the hotels. This is probably the key hotel out of four or five in Headley. And this is the Similkameen Hotel. And uh, it, was, it was really quite a spectacular hotel with a, corner, with a corner tower, which you'll find in hotels all through the West, especially in the Canadian West. Yeah. The mines, of course, kept operating. This next shot is just an amazing shot to me because it shows what you call a stope. Sure. Now, there's actually a person in that shot there. Yeah. That gives you the size of this. Well, it gives you an idea of the magnificence, of the richness of the ore. They mined this hole up to about 50 feet high, Mike, this cavern, because it was filled with ore. It wasn't they wanted a nice cavern here. That's there right. There was riches to be taken. That's out. right. Otherwise, it would have been a small tunnel. So, and that is just pouring down. And uh, and of course, heavy. And it's a dangerous job. You know, really, it is dangerous because a lot of the miners were killed. Here's an example, still sitting in the cemetery today. A guy called Harry Emberg. He dies in 1905 at 19 years old, Mike. And that that head headboard was probably put up by the Western Federation of Miners. Looks like one of their headboards. Yeah, in the grave sites uh, yeah. at the cemetery today. I, a name that keeps cropping up, James J. crops up again. Sure, here he is. Really, <laughs> I mean, James J. This is 1909, December the 23rd, two days before Christmas, red letter day, and in Headley, and all the businessmen are out there. The first train comes in, the Great Northern or the V V and E, and it comes in there, and they know that Headley is on the map. It's on the rail line. The rail line comes practically right through town. Yeah. And uh, of course, here's an example. This is a marvelous shot showing the, the dam at the, uh, at, on, the, on the Similkameen River, which provides power for the plant. There's a trestle. There's a great northern train going across. Marvelous stuff, Mike, and really. The, as you point out, the dam, because all of the tram and everything was electrically powered, sure. electrified. Here it is right here, Mike. Here, here's the electricity coming down from the sunny side and the nickel plate. And this is Ladies' Day at the mine, which happened once in a while, probably on a Sunday. And they take people up to visit. And it was quite, you know, it was quite interesting. The women were quite interested in the mine process. Well, they, their livelihood was obtained through that. This is a little bit of a different method of getting ore. The tram was one way. What did you call this? Uh, well, that, that, that's actually a car going up with equipment that these guys are not supposed to, not supposed to go ride that gravity feed line because they really haven't got as much control on it. And they went up and down. And sometimes, Mike, it didn't pay because one of them ran out of control. The guy who stayed with it survived. The guy who jumped was killed. And the guy who survived had a broken leg, and that's all. And uh, so it, it, it was very dangerous work now, indeed. That tram ran all the way up that mountainside. Yeah. A huge, a huge extent. Sure. What's the next sort of step along the way? You mentioned Woods a little while ago. Does oh, yeah. he's, he's got to get back into this somehow. Well, it's very interesting, Mike, is what is happening. All the time they are going on, and the Daily Reduction Company is still in place. Uh, old, uh, old Daily has died, and, but Woods is hanging on. And, what, and he's sitting there in Trout Creek, and they offer him $10,000, and he refuses. Uh, Ten years later, they offer him $30,000. That's a lot of money, Mike, then. That's 30000 little mess cash. got wedge. That's, that's that all. little tiny wedge, because that ore body is drifting towards that wedge, and they think maybe, maybe Duncan Duncan Woods had something. They offer him 50000 He's waited 15 years now, and he doesn't take it. It's 1898, you remember when he first staked this? They offer him $20,000 or $70,000. He doesn't take it. They offer him $100,000. He doesn't take it. Finally, the company changes hands. It becomes the Kelowna Exploration Company. And you know, this guy was strange because he hated the nickel plate. Yeah. And he'd be sitting in the Presbyterian church in Summerland. And suddenly in the middle of the service, he'd get up and say, no, no, I'm not going to sell to that nickel plate. No way. <laughs> and people would look at him. And this is right in the middle of the service. And he'd wander up. This guy is possessed by oh, this oh, idea. Yeah, he's really paranoid about it. But <laughs> finally, in the early 1930s, 1932, he sells for $150,000 cash. And the nickel plate passes, at least the mascot pl passes into the hands of the Kroner Exploration Company, and they go in there and mine out millions and millions of dollars of ore. Pretty but funny, the huh? strange thing was that he never really enjoyed it, right? Because a few, just very shortly later, he dies, and his, his sister, who hadn't waited really at all, she inherits his, his vast fortune.
with tenacity. What well, a mistake. Sure. But, I mean, 150, and he, <laughs> and he got what he needed down the road. Well, sure. Okay. We've got to take a break here, but when we come back, much more to talk about in the annals of Headley, and so little time to do it in. Be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Uh, thinking back to old woods, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, hold out and freeze out is the kind of game he was playing. But sure. in order for them to finally pay 150000 must have meant that uh -huh. the workings they were dealing with were running out. Oh, yeah. The nickel plate essentially had exhausted its best ore, in fact, all of its ore. So they had to go to the mascot fraction. And the mascot didn't disappoint them, Mike. <laughs> what it did is produce millions and millions of dollars more, and here's what they build up on the side of the cliff. You know, they build a they build a small town up there called the Mascot Camp. This is not just sort of mill buildings. This is this where the miners live. This is where they live. They even had a bowling alley up there for heaven's <laughs> sake. You roll out of bed on the wrong <laughs> side. You've got a, a long drop to the bottom. Well, it's on the eagles. You know, it's the eagles' perch. If you you make a false step, you're down two thousand feet. You're gone. And surprisingly, very few accidents up there, Mike. People were extremely cautious indeed. So in the 30s, wood sells, and for how much longer? Well, does, it does operates right through the 30s, and intermittently uh, through the 40s, and then right into the 50s, right into 1955. And between the mascot fraction, between the nickel plate, the sunny side, and the rollo, they produce over two million, over two million ounces of gold. And Mike, two million ounces of gold today in Canadian price is over two million, is about one billion dollars is about one billion dollars. That's, that's a staggering fortune from the Nickel Plate Mountain. And so it was up till 1955, punching it out. Sure. The really amazing thing that I find is that when if you go back there today, up on that hillside, still perches oh, those yeah. buildings. This is a classic shot, Mike, and it's a, tell, you know, it's, 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 it's a very interesting shot because it shows you the sheer precipitousness of the, of the area. And those, those buildings, as I say, are up to, up to five stories tall, and it's this shot, as you come around and looking at it, sheer down on both sides. I mean, it's really quite astonishing. And of all the mining camps in British Columbia that should be preserved, Mike, I think this is the one. This is the classic shot. Still sitting there after a third of a century. It's starting to fall to pieces now, Mike, and it, it, I think it's going to crumble. But it should be safe because really there's nothing else to match it on the Pacific Slope. It's remarkable. And you can see as the shot continues, catwalks down the faces of cliffs and, and down the ridge lines. You can just see a, a, a staircase going down the ridge line on the left there that these miners walked every day to and from work in all the weather. And that's right, in summer and in winter and they were icy, and of course they did have rails on them, but by golly, you know, it really is quite fascinating, because this is still, this is still a mining country, you know, Mike, and there are people still prowling around this area yeah. looking for another nickel plate, looking for another Headley mascot, looking for a Rollo or a Mound or all the rest of them. And they're still mining up at the top. Their mascot is still up at the top, uh, pulling in. It's now Corona Corporation that's doing it. That's right, practically a hundred years later. Isn't that remarkable? And as technology gets better, will we be able to extract even more from that area? There are people looking across the valley, Mike. Very interesting. Yeah, I've heard about how you're well, maybe <laughs> one of those people uh, finding little bits of this and that that, yeah. uh, that enthusiasts uh, find. Float ore. Float ore, okay. That's just a part of Headley. Headley is such a big story, we could yeah. go on for uh, probably another show, and we might do that in the future too, but if the story of Headley has fascinated you, join us next week as we talk more about gold trails and ghost towns in British Columbia. I'm Mike Roberts for Bill Barley. Have a good evening.